All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get rolling. So thank you for joining me. You have joined Learning and Evaluation, where to start. Um, if this is not where you want it to be, then I hope you'll still stay and join us. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background to where I'm coming from, and then we'll, um, we'll get straight to the, the content. Um, I think it's important to recognize where you're coming from. So this is me. Uh, to the left side, you basically have my childhood. Um, it's pretty split between Manila and Austin. And to the right is my adulthood and all the places I've lived, worked, and studied, uh, mostly around response to violence, case management, youth development, preventative health, um, displacement and resettlement. So these places, and more important, the people in these places, um, are who inform me and my work. And I didn't start my career out with program evaluation. I was always a program person, even though evaluation and learning was part of my work. Um, and that program experience is what informs me and my evaluation philosophies and strategies. So that's who you're hearing from. Um, now I'm at TASA, and for those of you who aren't familiar, TASA is the Texas statewide coalition of rape crisis centers, advocates, and survivors. And as an agency, we're committed to fostering a culture that respects the fundamental rights and dignity of all Texans. So you have our uh, organizational values in front of you, including promoting equity, improving access to services, building community through collaboration, and acknowledging the intersectionality of identities and systems and hopefully you will see that reflected in this webinar. And now I am the evaluation manager here at TASA, and my, my position is pretty new. I'm the first person to be the evaluation manager at TASA, and so I'm very much building this bridge as we are attempting to cross it. Uh, I see my job as really threefold. Number one is really gathering evidence and learning what works to address sexual violence and building partnerships locally across the state and nationally to learn more about what's effective. Um, the other part is to build capacity around the state and beyond on how we can evaluate, learn, and improve so we're working smarter and not harder. This job is already pretty hard. Um, and so I see this webinar as part of that. And the other part is to really push TASA to walk the walk and to spearhead our own eternal evaluation as well. So that is a brief introduction into um, me and where I'm coming from. In terms of what you can expect at this webinar, uh, I'll be really doing some framing around what evaluation could look like in a feminist anti-violence movement. Uh, we'll look at just kind of the nuts and bolts of what evaluation usually entails and then an overview on how to get started. And towards the end, we'll try to, to um, show you some examples, both mm -hmm. in what we're doing here at TASA and, um, and even with the webinar data with the stuff that you put in um, so that you can see a, a live example of that happening. So first off, I'd love to get an idea. I know I asked you how you feel about evaluation on the Google link, um, but I really want to do a quick poll just to find out um, where people are at with their knowledge of evaluation. Um, All right, we have about 80% um, voting, and it looks like 
30% are fairly new to evaluation, about 42% have some basics, and then 27% have a fairly good understanding. So that's exciting. Um, and hopefully um, you'll still have things to learn. And then my other question for you is how much experience do you have with evaluation? Some of you have already kind of answered that, that it's pretty new to you. But I know some people know things about evaluation but haven't evaluated very regularly. All right, we've got about 80% there. So, um, so it looks like a lot of y'all have tried some, but you're not feeling terribly confident about it. We've got about 30%. We're pretty split, uh, 30, 37, 33. Um, and then 33% evaluating things fairly regularly. So that's great. So just to be completely transparent, so I'm trying to gather three pieces of information before getting started. Number one, how you feel about evaluation. Number two, what you know about evaluation. And number three, how, what kind of experience do you actually have with evaluation? So thank you for sharing that. All right, so let's get rolling. Um, if you have any questions as they come up, please go ahead and put them into the chat box. Everybody's been muted to make sure that everybody can hear. Um, and I will get to them as they come along and I'll be asking y'all questions as we go along as well. So the first thing we want to kind of do is um, evaluation can be really uh technical. And so the first thing I want to do is differentiate between kind of big E, capital letter E evaluation and small E evaluation. Because uh, at the end of the day, evaluation, little E evaluation is about being curious and it's about being invested in the quality of your work, learning about what works and what doesn't. Um, and then big E evaluation has a bit more structure and formality in which you do it. And I hope to kind of cover both in this webinar. I'm not trying to advocate for one or the other. Um, I think it'll really just depend on your circumstance um, and where you're at in your agency and in your job in terms of what is more appropriate. Um, and we know that, you know, most of you, I would imagine, are working in the anti-violence anti field, whether within DV or sexual violence. And we know our work is not easy. Um, turnover in our field is super high. It's emotionally taxing. It's sometimes re-traumatizing. The pain ain't that great, you know. So why do we do it? Um, and, you know, I, I hear most often people want to do it because they want to make a difference. It's, it's something that's important to us. And so where I think evaluation really fits into this is, you know, are our efforts making a positive difference? Are they making, are we watering the plants? Um, or are we just getting the pavement wet? So making sure that we're, we're able to be as effective as possible in what we do. Um, so evaluation is really trying to determine with all the time and the energy and the money and the resources that we're using to do this thing, whatever that thing might be, is this thing doing what we intended it to do? Could we be doing it better? Should we be doing something different altogether? And evaluation is different from research in that way. Research tries to understand something more fully and it can influence strategies and practices. Evaluation must influence strategies and practices. Um, otherwise, what are we doing it for, you know? And the other thing I, I definitely wanna drive home is that um, 
often evaluation is couched as a means of being accountable to management or accountable to your board or accountable to your funder, right? So it's, it's often framed as kind of an upward accountability. So if you take anything away from this webinar, um, and people who have been in my trainings will probably recognize this before, it's that evaluation is also a means of being accountable to ourselves and to the communities that we serve. You know, we don't, we don't spend all day every day with funders. We don't get up in the morning and come to work because we wanna help our funders. We're wanting to help our clients. We're wanting to make a difference in our communities. And so our, our evaluation practices should reflect that. Um, and, and who we share our evaluations with, um, how we share our evaluations, the idea that transparency and accountability should flow both ways. Um, and you might want to know more about community investment. You might want to know more about community partnerships. But at the end of the day, why would they invest in you um, if you're not being accountable to them as well? So thinking kind of broadly about how we're um, how we're seeing accountability and evaluation and, and who gets to benefit from that learning. So what I'm going to talk about next are um, these ideas of what feminist evaluation is. And this comes from Seeger and Brissolara from uh, evaluation book in 2002. Um, but just recognizing that it's not really just asking questions and getting something, that evaluation in and of itself is a political activity. Um, sometimes we have a really narrow idea of what's political. It's red, it's blue, it's elephant, it's donkey. Um, but I really encourage you to kind of expand that because the, po the political is what decides where resources go, right? Who gets a bridge, who gets a wall, who has a bake sale, who gets shiny new things, who's well staffed, who's understaffed. So just a recognition that evaluations have political consequences. And we're talking about the framing of merit and worth and the assessment of merit and worth. And those have political consequences, even if only on an organizational or programmatic level. And the roles and power within valuations are political, right? Who's expected to do what, who's paid to do what, um, so when we're talking about the determination and the allocation and distribution of resources to clients, to staff, to programs, to organizations, um, how are our evaluative practices aligning in that? You know, most of us are well familiar with unhealthy economic dynamics and economic abuse on an interpersonal level. Um, and so how do we see those those kinds of controls on an organizational level as well. Um, and, and basically what I'm trying to drive home is that like evaluation can be used as a tool or it can be used as a weapon. And so um, not to understate what kind of impact evaluation can have and how important it is to do it well. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, knowledge should be a resource of and for the people who create, hold and share it. Um, are you providing services for people or with people? Do you see them as clients or are they just community partners? Um, so keeping in mind the power differentials, this principle speaks directly to, you know, holding power over or having power with or, or even power within in terms of the evaluation. So thinking about who provides the information who makes decisions, who controls information, and thus the learning, and who learns from the process. So just like an advocacy, informed consent applies to evaluation. So if you're collecting information, the people you're collecting information from deserve to know why you want it, if it's anonymous or confidential, um, and what you plan to do with their information and what they'll get out of it, and if it will affect services they receive, right? So in the same way that we've tried to provide, a f um, we try to provide options and survivors with their choices, well-informed choices, we want to be sure that we're doing the same thing with how we're collecting data from people. And then the other question is, who learns from your evaluations? To whom do you report your findings? 
how are your findings available and how often and what's changing because of it? Um, are you modeling accountability and open communication and, and growth to your clients? And the other part, and this is particularly speaking to kind of the intersectionality of it. Um, and the slides will not be available, but if you look at your materials, because the slides are, are only so useful because I use a lot of pictures. Um, but if you look at the materials within your go-to, you can actually see an outline with the main points there. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? I'm so sorry, thank you for letting me know. You all missed all my beautiful pictures. Let me fix that. Number one, hide. Okay, so my apologies y'all, and this is recorded. Uh, evaluation is a political activity, so there's that. Uh, knowledge should be shared, a resource of and for the people who create, hold, and share it. Knowledge and values are culturally, socially, and temporally contingent. So what I'm trying to say here with all of these baskets is that a basket is not a basket is not a basket. They've been developed to particular landscapes and needs and adapted over time. Um, and so have our societal practices and our social norms. You know, some things are universal, like a human smile, um, but when it's appropriate to smile, how wide you smile, what a smile means, all of that changes with culture and contact. Um, so, you know, what does not making eye contact mean? What does not responding mean? What does talking back mean? How those are interpreted, whose interpretation is given weight and credence, all of those are kind of important things to think about as you're doing an evaluation and interpreting responses, um, especially if you're doing things like evaluation. Uh, sorry, observation. And uh, if I wasn't preachy enough, I'm going to get even more preachy. Um, there are multiple ways of knowing. This is completely related to the, the previous slide. In some ways are privileged over others. So um, genealogy matters. Um, and evaluations kind of lineage arises from academia. Um, and academia loves to recognize individual achievement, you know, first authors, um, and crediting particular individuals for a particular nugget of insight. It's not really set up for collective knowledge or collective recognition outside of a formal institution. And so there's a bit of a crux there because the more people involved in the process, including the analysis, um, the more complete picture that you have. And we stand on the shoulders of those um, who came before us. And so, um, you know, sometimes evaluation can kind of show that lineage of if we think about, you know, anthropology as a field has evolved a lot since, um, but its roots have, you know, fairly colonial influences where you've got these scientists who go and try to make sense of the quote unquote natives or the quote unquote savages and, and then disseminate that knowledge to, and to colleagues. Um, and, and so you can kind of see how over time, that's kind of bled into our now our language. So we've got phrases that uh, like gone native or using the term underwater basket weaving as a joke of a college elective or even the term old wives tale or voodoo or black magic. They all kind of show like a degradation of a particular type of knowledge. Um, and so I think what's important in evaluation is that we're kind of checking ourselves. We're auditing ourselves. Um, and that we're shedding ourselves of these problematic and, and bad habits. And so I highly encourage you, even before you design a survey, even before you try to figure out what you want to collect, or if you have done those, just to kind of go over them and review um, whose knowledge is valued, whose presentation of the knowledge is given credence, um, who's presented with the findings, who's compensated for their knowledge. You know, I think um, there's a really interesting conversation around 
who gets paid to, to evaluate and to learn about a program? Um, and then how are the issues of power addressed in the evaluation? So these are all really kind of big picture um, framing around evaluation that I wanted to make sure to include even before we talked about the nuts and bolts. Um, and I think something that's really helpful that comes from our movement is um, our wheels. So does your agency's learning habits reflect an equal and respectful relationship? Um, and these came from womenaresafe.org, but I know that there's so many different varieties around. But, you know, as a simple kind of check is thinking about, you know, do we have shared responsibility? Is there trust and support in our evaluative practices? Um, what does economic partnership look like? So you're not just taking information um, and not compensating people for their information or their work or their analysis. Um, so I do want to ask and take a, a step here because I've covered a whole lot um, in 30 minutes. Do, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or qualms up until now? All right, I'm going to keep on chugging, but please feel free to type into the chat box if you do. Um, at the end of the day, the reason I'm spending 30 minutes on this, and I could probably spend even more time on them, is because the process of evaluation is as important as the product. The methodology is actually the easy part, but being intentional about the process um, is, is much harder. Um, and it is literally my job to support you in both of those, either in the methodology or in being intentional about the process. So if after this webinar, you're left with more questions or you wanna try to do something and you're not sure how to go about doing it, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that Evaluation requires constant practice. Um, a great feminist practice is to ask for whom, right? If we talk about effective, we think effective for whom, efficient for whom. Um, and at the end of the day, half done and hastily done evaluations are plentiful. Because um, it's, it's easier to leave people out of the analysis and the decision making and the reporting. And it, it's often not done out of malice. Um, and I've been part of those evaluations where it's just, there's, it's habit or it's a time crunch or um, evaluation wasn't incorporated into the program and the planning and the work plan. Um, and to follow those principles takes a tremendous amount of time and trust in relationship building. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't run a marathon. Um, start small, walk around the block, you know, consistently do one thing, an easy thing, and we'll talk about more examples of what that could look like if you're just getting started. But you wanna train your evaluation muscles and then increase your challenge by growing your evaluation practices, just like you would if you were, you know, training for a marathon, which I never have. Um, but <laughs> my position is now fully dedicated to evaluation and TASA is not running any evaluation marathons. I can guarantee you, we're still trying to get a look at, um, at our 5K time. So, um, so don't sweat it, we're not there yet. This is kind of us in a conversation about how to get there. And if your organization is running evaluation marathons, kudos to you, please let me know and we'd love for you to do a webinar for us. All right, I'm about to get into the nuts and bolts. Do we have any questions, comments, concerns up until now? All right, so we framed what evaluation can mean, so now what? So a lot of times you will hear that you need to do a logic model. My advice is do or don't do a logic model. Can I see in the chat box who all is familiar with a logic model? 
or who has done one, done one well, tried to do one, gotten frustrated? All right, so some people are familiar, some are not, probably not done. Well. They're hard to do well, uh, I will say that. Um, so logic models were initially meant as a tool to map out the assumptions and the theory of our programming, right? And it was meant to be concise shorthand for your program. Uh, so what kind of change would occur? And I would say that logic models are pretty heavily used in big E evaluation. In fact, if you contract with a, um, an external evaluator, one of the first things they'll probably do is like, do you have a logic model? Um, and they can be useful. This is me not saying that they're not useful. They are useful, but I would argue that they're not really necessary, especially if you're starting out. They might even frustrate you or discourage you more. And so here's why. Logic models are asking you about your inputs, your outcomes, uh, your end goal. And so a lot of times it can feel like you have these inputs and then some kind of miracle happens and then suddenly there's no sexual violence. But we work in one of the most complicated, complex, intractable problems that society has if you're working in, um, in sexual violence or gender-based violence, right? So they're fantastic if your program is pretty simple, if you have a pretty clear idea of what's necessary for a particular type of change to occur. They, they've come from international development to say that if we build a water well here, you know, X amount of people will have access to water and then X amount of health outcomes will happen. Um, but it's, it's not even that simple if you're building water wells, if you look at the long term. So if things could have been solved by putting things in boxes and drawing arrows to those boxes, you know, we would have ended sexual violence and poverty by now. We have not managed to do that. So um, I'm going to talk about kind of the, the elements that tend to be present in a logic model. And if you would like to organize that in a way, then you're more than welcome to. And I will totally support you in doing that. And you can reach out to me um, to work on your program's logic model if you'd like to. Um, and if that just seems daunting to you, then don't start there, start somewhere else and we can work up to it if, if that's the place you wanna go. Um, but what I do wanna say is that just because our work is complex and difficult doesn't mean that it's not worth learning and evaluating what works and what doesn't. And we can still look for patterns and entry points and, and what can seem like constant chaos and crisis. So here are the kind of nuts and bolts. I am completely taking inspiration from the National Latino Network, which has a great uh, research department. And they talked about using evaluation as a recipe and I love food and food speaks to me. So um, I'm going to do it here. You can find their, um, you can find a link to their resource in the materials. If you look at the little materials box and go to, you can find the handout there with an outline of this webinar and some additional resources. So um, I'm from the Philippines, so the, I love leche flan. And so this is my leche flan in the sky. When we're talking about goals, this is your pie in the sky or your leche flan in the sky kind of goal. So it could be ending sexual violence. It can be gender equality. Um, it can be that every survivor has access to culturally resonant resources and support. It can be those really big picture things, the kind of massive societal change that you're really hoping will take place. So that's your goal. And then we tend to talk about inputs. So your inputs are all the resources that you have to put into a program. So you yourself, um, your time, your knowledge, your skills, those are inputs. The materials that you use, the space that you use, donations that are given, all of those are inputs, right? They're the ingredients that you have that you're gonna put in to make this fantastic flan in the sky. And then you have activities. So these are all kind of tangible things. Um, so 
these are your sessions. They are what you do in your sessions. They are hotline calls. They are case management sessions. They are basically how you are combining your inputs with your community, with your clients, with your partners. All of those are kind of what we call activities. And then activities will usually produce outputs. So this is kind of the actual object, right? At the end of the do at the end of the day, what did you do? What was done? What was made? And outputs tend to be countable numbers. They don't describe quality. You don't know if this is any good. You just know that it exists. Um, it just describes what happened. So number of sessions, number of clients, number of participants, number of flyers distributed, all of those are kind of outputs. And then you have um, outcomes, and these are the stories. This is what changed happened. This is why was this worth doing? Why did you even want to have those sessions, right? So those outcomes can be individual. So this person clearly looks more happy because uh, they're eating that delicious flan and I would say that her face is indicative that the, the flan was of good quality. Um, and the outcome could tell the story of a family or it can still tell the story of a neighborhood or a community. So the outcome might be that, you know, community cohesiveness occurred, right? Like there was um, greater connectivity and you're, kind of looking at bigger protective factors there. And outcomes can also be unintended. As much as I love flan, it cannot be my um, main source of nutrition. And it might be that too much, too much ends up with cavities, right? So um, sometimes our programming, even with the best of intentions, don't hit the mark or they do something that we we didn't hope that they would do. And those are just as important to look for as the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve, um, which can also be one of the limitations of a logic model, right? So if you're only looking for what's inside the boxes, are you looking for what's happening that wasn't necessarily listed in the box? Um, so what I kind of want to drive up, and I've kind of couched them as, as the what's and the why's, um, is the what's, the, the activities, the inputs, the, the outputs, they're all a really good start. They're a perfectly solid start, and they are exactly that. They're a start. Um, they can and they should lead to questions that make you explore if the whys, right, the reasons that you're doing this are happening. Um, and... If we stop being curious at, did we have enough sessions? Did enough people come? Um, those should eventually lead to, to questions about quality, right? Again, we don't know if this is, this is any good. I might have mistaken the salt for the sugar, and uh, which I would have if I were baking. And you don't know if you got the proportions right. You don't know if it's undercooked. You can't measure quality by counting. Um, and you don't want to be in a position where you've just spent a whole lot of time, energy, money making yucky things. So um, at the end of the day, we want to find out if, you know, our clients felt more secure. Did they feel like they've achieved something in their healing process? Um, was awareness increased? Were attitudes or behaviors changed? Um, and sometimes grant reports can be focused on outputs, and that might be good, depending on your grantor. Um, but think about evaluating for yourself, for your agency, for your program, and what's important to you. Evaluate, evaluating your services and outcomes better positions you as an expert of the services and the programs that you provide. So um, I would just encourage everybody not to rely on your grantors to be the sole determiner of whether you're successful or not. Make sure that you're collecting your own data on data that's important to you in addition to what you're required to, to collect. Um, and continue to ask if the whys are happening. 
And hopefully we can build protective factors between clients, we can increase community investment, you know, look at policy change, all of those things are things that can be influenced when you're starting to look at the outcomes of whether something is happening. And once you've looked at that, then you can decide if you are hitting the mark or not. And if not, then adjust. And if things look good, then there might be slight improvements. It might just be refining. But the important thing is that you've, you've kind of looked at what the outcomes are, the outputs or the outcomes, and then you're adapting and refining or, or altogether changing, depending on what you're learning. Um, and so ideally you've got constant learning happening. You've got um, engagement with your community, you're fostering understanding, you're accessing, you're measuring, and then you're putting that to use. All right, so those are kind of the, the, the vocabulary that we tend to use on evaluation. Are there any questions so far on those? Is there any confusion that, that might be happening there? What's an outcome versus what's an output? All right. So uh, this is not your last chance to ask a question. Please go ahead and, and type your questions if you have any more. Um, into the box. So now I'll be covering what the steps of an evaluation are. So, whoops. Um, basically, you need to do some planning <laughs> and prioritize what you need to know. Uh, you need to do some data collection and you should go ahead and plan on cleaning that data. It will probably be a little dirty. Um, you need to Think about what the analysis is going to look like and how do you make sense of it. And then you have to think about what you're going to do with it, right? So what conclusions do you come to? What have you learned? What should you change? Who do you report that learning to? And then make those changes and repeat. Ah, excellent question. I will talk about what data cleaning means. Basically, it means that when you get, um, when you get raw data back, a lot of times you need to um, figure out what gets used and what doesn't get used. Sometimes um, it, it'll make more sense as we go along, but if you are doing a survey, for instance, and you have um, an other option, sometimes those other options might later be categorized. They might form another category that makes more sense. So. It's really the kind of analysis, um, initial kind of cleaning and analysis that you're doing with data once you get all of it. And hopefully that'll make sense in a second. So if I can give you one advice, if you're just starting out, it is collect no more than you need. It is really, really easy to get overwhelmed. And the more that you collect, the more time that you're gonna to need to plan to figure out what to do with it. Um, and if you're collecting qualitative data, if you're co collecting open-ended responses, if you're collecting stories, um, even more so. It's, um, it's really important to kind of differentiate what we want to know and what we need to know. And, and be clear in that when we're kind of selecting what, what information we want to capture or what questions we want to ask. So if you're, if you're just starting off, if this is your foray, your first foray into evaluation, really think about what's really urgent and important for you to know, need to know. What's urgent and important for you to need to know. Um, and start there and make sure that you can manage that and then look at expanding your questions. Um, because it, it's not just as easy as a survey and, and, and that's it. <laughs> it's a little bit more involved. And you don't wanna collect data that you don't use. Um, not for you, not for your clients. Um, so keep it simple. Um, 
think about whether you want to figure out if people are satisfied with your services, um, if people are effective, if your services are effective, you might want to look into your community reputation um, and then have an idea of, you know, as you're collecting things, what will you want to be different from how it was before? So if somebody came into your services, how will they, how will you want them to be different when they leave your services? Um, and how will you know if that's happening? How will you capture that? What will you see? Who will be involved? Um, and we'll get more into the when, where, and with whom stages of these things um, in a second. If you are, again, just starting out, and it seems like a, quite a few of you are, then I suggest just thinking about what you already have. What are you already collecting? Um, and maybe people can share into the chat box. If you think about what your agency currently uses, what, what data do you currently have to work with? Do you have um, exit interviews? Do you have case notes? How are you tracking um, what's happening at your agency? So for example, for TASA, and please go ahead and, and type into the chat now um, while I describe TASA's process right now. Uh, TASA is currently in a major overhaul at looking at our data um, because our data doesn't talk very well together. So we are trying to be very reflective and changing our practices so that our, um, our different programs data will talk to each other um, we collect evaluations at the end of every uh, workshop, usually, and so um, individual trainers will use those evaluations. Um, if we provide TA, we usually send some sort of evaluation out to people that we do TA with. Um, I'm seeing case notes, but having a hard time creating it into quantifiable, quantifiable measures to measure success. Thank you. Yeah, that's often the case and case notes tend to be kind of plentiful and they also can't say that much in case they get subpoenas. So um, exit interviews, community referrals, attendance, self-reported feedback, what they liked, what they didn't like. Absolutely, these are great starts. Um, for case notes, there's something that you can do that's kind of, um, that can kind of help you sort your data within your case notes. Um, it's a little bit more involved. So please um, contact me if you've got questions about how to make case notes more useful in terms of evaluation. Um, client satisfaction surveys, fantastic. That's great. Um, so those are fantastic solid starts to even dive deeper into, right? So, and I, I don't know how deep you dive into them, but I'll give you some examples of that in a second. So the first thing you wanna do is think about, um, once you've kind of figured out what you wanna know, what your questions are, You've got to think about the data collecting, the data storing, the data compiling, and kind of preparing the data for analysis. And the preparing data for analysis is, is usually what I call data cleaning. Um, so when you're thinking about collecting uh, information, the, the tool absolutely matters. So here's a couple of options that we're going to go to, but what I do want to be able to differentiate is kind of whether you're collecting numbers or whether you're collecting stories. So stories are usually qualitative data and numbers are what we call quantitative data. You can get numbers from stories. You cannot get stories from numbers. That said, numbers are much easier. They're just not as rich. So numbers are a boiled egg and stories are a souffle. Um, and that's not to say that you should always go with stories um, or look for stories or ask for stories. 
you also want to set yourself up for success. So what's your capacity? How much time do you have realistically in your work plan to dedicate to evaluation and looking at those stories? If not very much, numbers are a good place to start. Um, so the kind of common ways that we tend to capture data is through interviews uh, or testimonials, intake and ex exit forms, focus groups, observations, visual and creative methods, and I'll show you an example of um, the photo facilitation deck for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, open-ended surveys, or open-ended responses, and then surveys. So interviews, and for each of these, there is you know, somewhere out there a toolkit just for this particular thing. Uh, so if there's one thing that interests you and you don't want to dive into the sea of toolkits and information out there, please feel free to ask me if I have recommendations on any particular one. Um, interviews are, are fairly simple, but and they lead to stories. And depending on how many that you do, they tend to get um, pretty overwhelming. Traditional interviews are an evaluation marathon. It's a lot of data to transcribe, to clean, to analyze, to report out. You know, dissertations are done in these. So if you don't have time for a dissertation, uh, you might want to consider how you're thinking about interviews. And you might think about just one or two questions as opposed to a very long uh, interview that you might want to prioritize to ask uh, clients or participants. Um, you might think of face-to-face -face polling with like a solution-based question um, that can kind of get at what you're wanting to know. So if you're wanting to know how services can be improved, um, you might ask, you know, if we had a million dollars to add or enhance any of the things that we do, what do you think we should do? And sometimes those answers won't even require a million dollars. Sometimes those answers will be fairly simple. Sometimes they will. Um, but it'll kind of let you know where people are seeing the gaps and where they think resources will be dedicated, even though you don't have a million dollars. And I will, um, I will have to dig into my library for a toolkit of interviews. TASA has one for sure on interviews and focus groups. Um, and National Latino Network also has some great ones as well. And you can see um, their website in the materials page, and they've got a bunch of really amazing stuff. Um, focus groups. Uh, is basically the group version of interviews, except that you get to benefit from the presence of other people and them kind of building off of each other's ideas. And you can collect um, a lot more information from more people in a shorter amount of time. However, you do also have to think about power dynamics and personality dynamics and kind of who's taking up space in focus groups to kind of um, navigate through that and and make sure that your data isn't just being reflective of the one person who's speaking out quite a bit during the focus group and is actually reflective of the diversity of thought that's within the group um observation i don't think that this is used enough um and it's 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 how can i say this it seems simple but it isn't um Observation is basically writing down what you notice. The, the crux is to do it consistent, consistently and systematically. So look for the same things consistently. And this would be really appropriate if you're looking at group lessons or group sessions, uh, prevention programming, um, if you're doing tabling and outreach, if you are even looking at the dynamics of your waiting room, right? Um, it could be appropriate for shelter common rooms, but really taking notice of where people are interacting and how you're hoping they'll interact in a particular way. And so as long as you do it the same time over time, consistently and systematically, um, 
then you can um, really start to notice what kind of differences are occurring and you can start to get to those outcomes. Um, those, those numbers will start to tell you a story as they change. They won't tell you very much about the story, but they will tell you that something is happening. And that's really important. Surveys, people love surveys. Um, so surveys are definitely useful. I've used them. I continue to use them. Um, they are useful to a point. Um, and depending on where you are and what you're trying to get, they may or may not be the best thing to use. And developing survey questions is harder than you think. Um, it's, it's so hard that, you know, at evaluation conferences, we have sessions just on how to ask survey questions. Um, that said, you know, they, they can get you a whole lot of information very quickly. Um, and that said, they still require a lot of time afterwards to kind of figure out what's meaningful. And I'll, I'll share an example of that towards the end as well uh, with our National Sexual Assault Conference data. Um, one of the more flexible, um, I think, culturally responsive ways of collecting data is through art and storytelling. And that's because you're not framing the question in any particular way as you tend to in surveys, you're leaving it really open-ended. Um, and so it, this I think is great as a means of being more culturally flexible. It also requires a lot more, um, a lot more input from the person who's creating the art or telling the story to also be included in the analysis because you don't know what that story means to that person. You don't know, you know, in this mural, you don't know what that I means. You may or may not recognize the medicine wheel in the, in the middle of it. And so the symbolism is really important to the creator and you would need to make sure to incorporate that into your analysis as you're doing art and storytelling. And um, and you're going to have to probably <laughs> clean your data. So if you're doing a survey, you might have incompletes, right? Or you might have a whole bunch of pre's and not as many posts. So what ends up happening is at the end of the time, you're going to have to figure out, do I count pre's if they don't have a post? Or do I count incomplete surveys? Or do I count them if they didn't ask this question? Um, so cleaning your data means basically looking at what everything that you've gotten and making judgment calls on how to best make sense of this and what gets included and what doesn't. So that's what I mean by, um, cleaning your data. And so, um, if you'll do a survey and not every answer is required, you might see that, um, that, that you've got only partial responses for some things. Um, and that was probably a choice when you made not everything required. Um, people might have been misinterpreting the question, so you get really odd answers. Um, and that might be indicative of a badly worded question, or it might've just meant that it, the question meant a different thing to that person who answered it but now you've got this answer and you don't know how to categorize it or you don't know what to do with it so it's basically being very intentional and making judgment calls about how to deal with with unexpected data or data that didn't come to you as you had hoped and then you have to think about so how often you're collecting data with whom um you also have to think about how often you're stopping to take a look at that data um, and to actually make meaning of it. And so when we talk about analyzing, basically we're talking about all of my favorite childhood games. And you can do this by yourself, you can do this as a team, you can do this as a program, um, or you can do it all of those ways. Um, but a lot of times we kind of, and I think this comes from the genealogy, we think of this one person who's making sense of all of this data and sitting with their complex computer program to run all these models. 
and it can be that. Um, but it can also be people in a room having a conversation about what they're looking at. It can really just be as simple as that. So when we talk about analyzing, basically you're trying to figure out how are you connecting the dots? Um, what kind of patterns are you seeing in, in the responses or the data that you're getting back? looking for what's the same, looking for what's different. How do people experience your program differently? What are some of the factors that determine how people experience your program? Um, and that can kind of let you know who you're serving well and, and maybe also who you're not serving so well. Whoops. Um, but basically what you wanna do is look for meaning. Um, and there is an element of ego that you may have to let go of in terms of really looking at the analysis. Um, asking questions about your programming and if people are satisfied with your programming and to see whether people liked what you did or whether what you did was meaningful, this has the potential to be like the test that you thought that you aced only to find out that you didn't do so hot. Um, so something that we kind of have to prepare ourselves for is that we might have to hear things that we did not want to hear. Um, and it's important to ask questions that you actually want the answer to. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, you have to figure out if you wanted to hear that you did a good job or if you want to learn how you can improve. Um, so I think especially, you know, considering how complicated, how complex, how um, messy sexual violence, gender-based violence looks like in life, you know, it's no surprise that that would also be the case in, in how we're trying to make sure to serve survivors um, and work with survivors and, and prevent um, violence from occurring. So I just want to encourage you that feedback may not always come in the most polite way, but it's still thinking about how we take those responses into consideration and look at growing as a movement and, and growth sometimes hurt. In fact, growth usually hurts. Um, and you may end up with more questions and that's okay. That's part of learning. We all have to start somewhere. So now I'm going to um, be extremely, <laughs> I'm going to model vulnerability and show you some of our data and to kind of give you an idea of what we are doing. Does anybody have any questions up into here until uh, before I get into the example? And I'll give you an example of um, what Tasa did for one of our conferences. And I'll also give you an example of, um, of this webinar. Um, with that link that y'all initially went into. I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm gonna keep chugging. And if questions come up, please let me know. So in 2017, last year, we had the National Sexual Assault Conference. And so this is one of the questions that we asked for our national conference uh, during the evaluation. Some of you, on here may have answered it. Uh, and it was a two-part question. The first one was more quantitative data. It's just trying to identify how many people um, felt a particular way during the conference. And then we asked a qualitative question about why or how they felt that way during the conference. So we, um, we were pretty happy with this. Uh, over 75% reported that they felt inspired Definitely the, the top feelings were, you know, what I would interpret as positive feelings, inspired, hopeful, empowered. And then the first kind of um, maybe not entirely positive feeling is that overwhelmed somewhere in the middle. Um, and so, and I would say that this, this was corroborated with the comments that we got back as staff as we were in the conference, as people came up to us and shared their thoughts and opinions. Um, and then some of the none of these, you know, were, were pissed off. <laughs> the, the comments, that qualitative question really kind of let us know what they were thinking on that. Um, and so 
for those of you who were there, I think Tassa made a very um, intentional attempt to, to really be more, um, to really be more uh, intentional, I hate to use that word again, around race and ethnicity in our movement um, and, and how it interacts in our movement. And I think that that was reflected. Um, and so one way that I wanted to make sure to look at this data to figure out who was feeling what was to look at the race and ethnicity of the participants. And so if we looked at the top one, we saw that um, API, for those who don't know, means Asian Pacific Islander. It is a category that literally describes half the world. Um, but as you can see, a lot of them were feeling inspired. So that's great. And then if we looked uh, going down, you know, in, in terms of who was more inspired and not as inspired, um, we have Asian Pacific Islanders, Black or African American, Native American, Latinx, and then down towards the bottom, white, Middle Eastern, and multiracial. But all of them still over 50% reporting that they felt inspired. So that was really good to know. It was interesting and in seeing and reflecting on, you know, what the keynotes were and what the sessions were. I think that um, that, that was something that we had hoped would happen uh, in terms of making sure that uh, people who tend to be most marginalized in this country period, <laughs> uh, so Black, African-American, Latinx, Native American, um, are, are able to feel centered in our movement. And so we were hopeful that that was going to be reflected because of the choice of sessions and and keynotes and then if we looked at overwhelmed um then it was interesting um so if you look down you've got like 10 20 30 percent but you'll see that the the ones who felt most overwhelmed were those who identified as white. So what does that mean at the end of the day? What does that mean for TASA? What do we need to do to not to stop <laughs> making sure that people are feeling inspired who felt at the top, but how do we also make space for those who feel overwhelmed? Um, so these are questions that we'll be needing to have as a staff um, going forward in terms of you know, how do we continue to grow and make intentional spaces and conferences um, and still paying attention to what people are having in the room and, and being more intentional about everybody having a space to kind of work through their feelings. And that, that exercise, that looking at the data, that kind of slicing and dicing it and figuring out which ways that you want to look at it, all of that requires space and all of that requires time um, and intentionality. So it means physical space, it means space in your calendar, and it means space in your brain, um, which is hard because we have lots of work <laughs> we're expected to do. And evaluation isn't always, um, isn't even on the list sometimes in terms of how we run our programming. So thinking about if, if we're wanting to really put all of those surveys, those client data to use, what chunks of time are we giving ourselves to actually make sense of what we're getting? I would encourage you to throw data parties and I'll have more information on that in a bit, but make an occasion of it, you know, have a, a team meeting dedicated really just to looking at what data that you've got as a team. Um, plan a retreat, get to a different space if you can, share snacks, snacks are always good. Um, but it doesn't have to be this kind of clinical, sterile um, activity. You can, you can make it suited to, to your, your team's character, your agency's um, culture. And then the other thing to do, once you've made sense, you've collected it, you've cleaned it, you've made sense of it together, is just to figure out how you want to share it. A lot of times people think 
that um, an evaluation has to be this big, huge 40 page report that nobody actually has any time to read. But there are other ways that we can share data other than reports. So if we can think about community meetings, we can think about board presentations, we can think about um, how we communicate with clients, we can think about team meetings, memos, email lists, you know, um, if you've got uh, listservs, communicating what you're finding back to your listservs so that people know what kind of impact that you're making. Um, always, other than a really lengthy report that no one will probably read. And at the end of the day, really just do something. <laughs> do, do, do anything. Um, I, I've said it before, I'm gonna say it again, start small. The worst thing that can happen is that you get overwhelmed with data and then you, you end up doing nothing and you're like, well, I tried, but I couldn't do it. Um, so really just think of like, you know, if you start with one question, you start with one question and you go from there. Uh, but the key is to be consistent, be consistent, be consistent. It doesn't mean never change it. It just means that you want to consistently ask and can consistently reflect. And you might need to um, change your questions over time, which means that if it's not working, then try something else. Um, don't, don't accept failure the first time around because this is tricky. It is hard. Asking a good question is hard. Um, I don't wanna understate that enough. Um, it requires really a knowledge of, of your clients and their context and how they're understanding it, um, which can be different than the way that you are imagining things. All right, so we have about uh, 20 minutes left. So what I'd love for y'all to do is go to this website and I will show you, oops, um, a, an example of what that would look like just for this webinar as a whole. Um, and if you go there, then you will find um, an example of a more art-based response. So I'll show you how we've used photo facilitation decks here at CASA to evaluate our sessions. Thank you, Denise. A big applause to Denise Loya, who's helping me with the chat rooms. So I'm going to show y'all what this looks like. So and when we first started um, the evaluation, and let me just check the chat box to make sure that nobody's lost. Um, I had y'all ask these questions or answer these questions. So how do you feel about program evaluation? That's a pretty open-ended responses. And so what I basically had you do was categorize your own response so that I didn't have to an analyze those, right? So somebody might have put like, I feel like evaluation, I, I feel the same about evaluation as I feel about um, a car. And I wouldn't know what to make of that response, right? So that's why I asked the second question, how would you categorize that, whether it's positive, neutral, or negative, and then job description. So here are the words that you gave me, which are good, they're fine. And then I see that half of y'all feel meh <laughs> about evaluation, and half of y'all feel positive, which is actually better than most cases, I feel like. Usually there's quite a bit of negative feelings around evaluation. So that's the first time I've gotten that, that's interesting. And then kind of letting me know where y'all are coming from. So I see a lot of program directors and managers and coordinators, which, which makes sense. Um, so that kind of let me know where y'all were at at the beginning. 
And so now here's the visual one. And let's see how many of y'all have responded. Three, all right. Not the best response rate, but four, fantastic. Maybe I'll give y'all a couple of seconds, a uh, couple more seconds to respond to that. Um, so while y'all are responding to that, and I'll show you a bit more um, about, I, one of the easiest things to do is to use Google Forms for me. Um, it's free, it's free, it's great to share data within a team, it minimizes data entry, um, it's free. Um, but it's definitely not something to use if it's not anonymous. Do not think of this as secure by any means. Um, if internet or phone cell coverage is an, is an issue, then you probably don't wanna rely on Google Forms. Um, and if your clients and your participants don't like the internet, <laughs> they're not really good on tablets or they don't have smartphones, then this is probably not the thing that you wanna use. Um, so I will go back to my web page and see how this is shaping up. Okay, we've got seven responses. So I asked for a picture and the picture is really just an entry point, right? Like it's just kind of an open-ended way to let me know, but I, I don't know what this means to y'all. So, except for maybe the dead end sign. Um, and so you've got your interpretation of what that, that picture means to me, right? So I'm not doing the analysis of what that picture means to you. I am basically asking you to interpret your own response. Um, and I'm so glad that somebody sees a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I am also really glad to hear that somebody under, somebody sees how, um, complex it is and, and how we can really integrate evaluation into how we we um, we go forward with an with anti-oppression work. Um, and there's a slight change. Hooray. So it looks like some of y'all are still pretty ambivalent about it. Um, which, you know, I also recognize the limitations of an hour and a half webinar to change your mind on program evaluation. Uh, but it looks like there's more positive feelings about that. So, um, so hopefully this was, you know, a very simplified version of kind of how to look at data, how to give people different ways of responding to you besides just um, how satisfied are you to be able to get um, more to kind of the outcomes that might have been happening. All right, does anybody have any questions about what I did. This was kind of a unusual pre and post. Uh, many of you might have heard my feelings about pre and post tasks, but this is kind of a way that I think that pre and post can be done um, in a slightly different way. And because it's um, it's Google, I get real time updates on how this is changing. Um, so what I'll do eventually is I'll go back and look at all of your responses and, and I would code them, right? So ready to go. So that would indicate that they're, they're, um, somebody is ready to start doing evaluation, positive, enlightened. So, um, so I'm heartened by the responses that you're giving. So thank you. And the response rate right now is nine. So an important thing to know also is no data is also data. Um, so if I'm getting a low response rate, that might be because some of y'all have napped during this webinar. It might be because y'all would rather not have your responses live on the recording of this webinar for all time. There's all sorts of factors that could have gone into that. Um, but it gives me a starting point to be like, hmm, only nine people responded. So that's good to know. Am I only hearing from the people who thought positively about the webinar? All right, so with the remaining time that we have, um, I do wanna let y'all know that this is something that I did last year. I did a bit of a, 
a data boot camp with uh, prevention workers and we got together in a space and we looked at our programming goals and hashed out an evaluation plan and some people even put those plans into action. Um, so I'm going to be offering the same thing. It's, it's pretty limited space just because the work is pretty intense um, and I only have a limited capacity to work with so many people. So it'll probably be around um, maybe between six and eight people. Uh, so that's probably looking like three to four different programs um, that can come in. So if you'd like assistance in developing either your evaluation plan or if you'd like assistance in looking at your data or if you just need time and space to look at your data away from your agency, um, then let me know. You can email me and let me know that you're interested and I will start getting a list up of people um, once we have those dates really firmed. It'll be about a, a day and a half here in Austin. Um, so just wanted to plug that. And does anybody have any questions that they'd like answered? All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so um, I'll hang out here for a little bit longer. If anybody has any questions, and you can feel free to send them just to me, if not the entire audience. But uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I'm making sure that I'm not missing any slides. Yes, all right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a fantastic Friday. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me and ask me questions if you have any.